So today we are finishing up the series we've been in this month called uh, How to Follow Jesus. And um, if you haven't been here for any of the series, I want to get you caught up real quick, um, and then we'll, we'll get into it. But, uh, but this series really came out of the fact that every year in January, I try to do kind of like a fundamentals sort of series. Uh, it, January is a natural time where we're all looking at kind of the future, what's ahead, where we've been, where we're going. Whether or not you're a goal setter or a resolution setter, it's just a season where we naturally are looking ahead. And so within that, I, I like to take that as an opportunity to talk about kind of the basics. Uh, it's easy to get caught up in stuff that doesn't really matter sometimes, or, or it's easy to get caught up in stuff that maybe is important, but it's not the core stuff. And so I like to take this as an opportunity every year to just kind of go back to basics. What is the, man, what is the most important stuff that if you do it, if you put it into place in your life, it's going to change your life in the long run. It just is. And so, um, so we've been through a few different messages in this series and, and tackled a couple different topics. Um, the first week we talked about, uh, we, we talked about just making God the center of everything instead of kind of orienting your life around God, or sorry, instead of kind of orienting God around your life, orienting your life around God. Uh, in the second week, we talked about uh, developing a, a good, strong prayer life and how vital that is to listening to and hearing the voice of God in your life. So that, because like you can't follow Jesus if you don't talk to Jesus, if you don't know where he's going. And then in part three, last week, I talked a little bit about, uh, about how to read the Bible and how, uh, how vital it is that we have a, a relationship with the scriptures, that, that we're able to, uh, to, to go to the scriptures, that we're able to spend time in the scriptures over time because it just changes us and it helps us be able to discern God's voice. The problem with this series is that when I talk about prayer, when I talk about Bible, I mean, we're talking about like spiritual disciplines here in a lot of ways. It's very difficult sometimes, especially if you're young in your faith, to know what God's voice is, right? We talked about that in week two. It's very difficult sometimes to know if it's God talking to you or if it's just like you thinking or if it's you being logical and rational or if it's uh, sometimes I even hear people say like, well, is this like, is it Satan trying to fool me? And that's, that's a hard place to be if you don't know. And, and, and being able to develop and have a good relationship with the scriptures, spending time in the scriptures over time is one of the primary ways that I think we're able to know and discern the voice of God because the scriptures help us to learn who God is and what matters to him, which helps us filter. But there's a second thing that I think is equally important um, in the way this plays out in real life. In other words, I don't think that what I'm going to talk about today is as important as the scriptures are. <laughs> But I do think that it's as important as the scriptures in us trying to figure out, is God talking to me or not? Is, is this something that God is leading me into? Uh, because the reality is this. If you're going to follow Jesus, you have to know where Jesus is going. If you're going to know where Jesus is going, you have to be able to listen to an inaudible voice, which is a hard place to be. So we've got to be able to discern, is it God or is it something else going on? So what I want to talk about today, like I said, is, is to me it's equally important as, as, as the Bible in the way this plays out in day-to-day -day life, okay? So, um, so here's the thing. Last week I talked some about how we, we're at a fundamental disadvantage sometimes in our faith. Now I talked about this last week in regard to the scriptures. And, and, and kind of where I went with it was, was that the, the, the men and the women who wrote the Bible, who wrote the words of the Bible inspired by God, those people lived with a fundamentally different worldview than you and I. Because of that, we read things into the Bible that aren't there sometimes, or we don't understand the way they communicate things at times because they're writing from a completely different perspective and worldview than we are. And without like a lot of study, it can be hard to get into that, into that space. But it wasn't just in the writing of the scriptures that that happened. The worldview that those men and women had as they wrote the scriptures and as they experienced life was completely different than modern American culture. And so we're at a very big disadvantage in our faith because some of the things that are absolutely foundational, fundamental, the most basic, that are kind of assumed in the scriptures are things that are completely the opposite of what we sort of intuitively know or as assume based on our culture. Specifically, here's what I mean in this case. We live in a very individualistic culture. 
American culture, Western culture is all about picking yourself up by the bootstraps, making something of yourself, doing things on your own, being strong, being tough. It's, a, it's, it's about you. And this comes out in all kinds of different ways. And it, and it has completely overtaken a more traditional, in a biblical sense, a more traditional view of your relationship with God. Here's the best way I know to describe this practically. If you've been in church for any period of time in your life, you've heard people talk about your personal relationship with Jesus, right? Your personal relationship with Jesus. You've got to read the Bible. You've got to pray. You've got to develop, work on your personal relationship with Jesus. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. That's a good thing. But are you aware that the phrase personal relationship with Jesus is nowhere in the Bible? It's not there. Like, anywhere. It does not exist. Now, that's not to say that people in the Bible didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. But the emphasis in our culture and in Western Christianity on your personal relationship with God is odd to me when it's not even a biblical concept, really. And that creates all kinds of chaos and all kinds of problems. And it does because what we end up doing is we pursue God in isolation, like we do everything in our lives in isolation. And maybe we're a part of a church family. Maybe we come to services once a week. But we still, like, in in the way that we actually process our faith, we're still very individual in it, right? Like, sit in your room or sit in your living room, read your Bible, pray by yourself. It's very individual. It's very isolated. And that is the exact opposite of the way that the biblical writers and the characters of the Bible would have experienced faith. It's the opposite of the way God actually, I believe, intended us to experience faith. Which is to say that in in, in a biblical context, faith was very communal. It was about the people, not a person. And so there wasn't this emphasis on a personal relationship with God. Like, did you know that most people up until about 500 years ago didn't even have access to to the scriptures of their own? They did not have access to a personal Bible to read. So what would happen is there would be a community of of, of believers, a community of faith, and they would have scrolls that were housed in like a central library or, or the temple. Or they would be housed in a central area, and then people would go to the temple, and they would read the scrolls and the scriptures together. And then they would talk about what the scriptures meant together. And it was all very communal, which... To me, and probably to you, is like, well, that sounds odd. I mean, we kind of do it here, but not really. Even this is very individual. I sit down and I study and I, and I prepare and, and my friend Chris comes in and helps me and that helps me sort through all the madness and chaos in my brain and kind of come up with it. But it's still, it's very isolated. And that's not the way that it was in the Bible. And here's the reason that matters. Because when we pursue God in isolation, it becomes very, very easy to get into left field with what we think and what we believe, even if we don't intend to at all. I've, I've railed on this a bit before, so I'll save it, but um, I, I'll, I mean, I'll mention it quickly, but I won't go on about it. One of my least favorite phrases in American culture is live your truth. That is a terrible way to live. It's, it's ter- like, If you've ever had children, you know they should not live their truth. Their lives would be terrible. They would think they're awesome, but they wouldn't be. If my son, my middle son lived his truth, he would only eat Sour Patch Kids and drink orange juice and play video games. That's all. (laughs) Okay, so maybe that sounds fun to him, but is he better for that? Well, no, of course not. He would be much worse off for that. Live your truth is a terrible way to live. And, and, and when you look at the biblical model of what it looked like to live in a faith community, of what it looked like to be a person of faith, faith was very, it, it was done in community. And part of the reason for that is because it's really hard to run into left field when you're a part of a community. I've had some conversations lately with some, some friends who have kind of been, uh, who have been trying to work with other friends that I don't know very well. And, um, and, and I keep hearing these, th- these themes of like, my friend will communicate about their friend and they'll be like, yeah, they're just, they keep telling me like, well, I'm just gonna figure this faith thing out on my own. God will lead me. I mean, yeah, you will, but how are you gonna know what to listen to and what to ignore? When you start to ask the question about, well, is this God leading me or is it, is it the enemy? Is it Satan? 
Well, if you don't know how to discern the difference, okay, go to the Bible. But what if you still don't know? You know, one of the very best tactics we have is to go to other people who have been there and done that. Is to have a family of believers around you, of people who have followed Jesus through their life, who have learned how to discern the voice of God, who know the scriptures inside and out, and who can help figure out, is this true or is this a lie? Or, or are, you, are, you, are you thinking right or are you thinking wrong? In, in talking to people and in, in counseling people and help, in, in helping people work through things. I remember sitting just right over here a, a couple years ago now and, and working with, with a, a lady who um, many of you know named Kathy. And she, she, was, she was really struggling with her mom's death. And, and, and she kept, she kept kind of saying these things that, that she was thinking and believing. And as she would say them, I'm, I'm thinking like, that's just a lie from the pit of hell. And she doesn't even know it. Like things about how, how if she would have done this or that differently, her mom would still be alive. And I'm like, no, that's no. You're just now putting yourself on the hook for something that's not your responsibility. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to play savior when that's not your job. And so, you know, we're talking, we're talking. And I, I ended up writing down, I, I identified five what I thought were really key lies that she was believing. They were just not biblical at all. And I wrote them down, and then I wrote, I wrote lie, and then I wrote truth. And I gave her verses and passages of Scripture to read through and process. Like, here's the lie you're believing, but here's the truth of what God says about you. And you've got to replace this with that, or else you're never going to get through this. Well, she didn't know. So she needed people around her to keep her from going out into left field and completely derailing her life and her faith. And I can't tell you the number of people that I've sat down with, and I've heard similar things, and... Th th we need each other. You know, there are times that I learn stuff from people. Like I'm a pastor and I have a Bible college degree, but I certainly don't have everything together. I need to be learning from people. Some of you, I've, in conversations that we've had, I've learned things. I've, 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 I've heard maybe, you know, your, your, your view or your experience of, of a particular passage. And I've gone, oh man, I never, I never thought about it like that. That's fantastic. And it shaped my preaching and it shaped my theology. And like we, we must have that collectively because that's the way God intended it from the very beginning. We live isolated individual faith and that is not the way that it was intended to be. And this completely changes how we read and understand the scripture at times. For example, uh, in week one, I read to you a passage that, that's known in, in uh, the Jewish tradition as the Shema. The Shema is from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And this is a fundamental foundational passage for people who are Jewish to this day. Uh, it, it's kind of like their, their ethos. And uh, I read it to you in the context of like, for you, you've got to make the center of everything that you do. It's got to be God. You can't, re you can't reorder that. It's not that God fits into your life. It's that your life is oriented around him. It's a fantastic passage, but I want to read it today with this in mind, that, that when this was written, uh, if, you, if you look at it, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4, it begins with, listen, O Israel. Listen, O Israel. The way this begins, it's community. It's the people of God, not the individual person of God, the people of God. This whole passage is communal in nature, and that shifts some things. So watch. Uh, God says, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. Now, if I could translate this, Vanessa, my wife, is from West Virginia. Her whole family is from West Virginia. So there is, there is some Southern. When she gets on the phone with her parents, her voice completely changes. It all of a sudden shifts into Southern. Um, so let me, let me translate this. Um, and, and all y'all, and all y'all must love the Lord your God with all y'all's heart. It's a plural you. It's not a singular you. You, you all, you as, a, you as a body. Does this apply to us individually? Yes. Okay, we're not throwing the baby out with the bath. 
You all, you as a family, you as a group, you must love the Lord your God. Listen, Israel, the country, the people, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength. And you all and all y'all must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home. Now, this is interesting. Again, if we, t- if we think about this in terms of community, who are we talking to them? Who are we talking with? Well, you might initially think my family, this is talking about in my family, right? Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up, tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders, write them on the doorposts of your house. Well, why do you need them on the doorposts of your house if it's just for you individually and your family? And write them on your gates. Look, here's the point. When we read this from a communal lens, who are we talking to? Each other. One another. Not just, not just our kids, not just our spouse or our significant other, or our, but each other. In the worldview of the nation of Israel at this time, they, there would have been no reference point none for I'm going to go into my tent because they were living in tents at the time. I'm going to go into my tent and I'm going to study the scriptures by myself. They would have been like, what? Why would you do that? No reference point. And so as God gives these instructions to the nation of Israel, they would have heard them all through a community lens. Talk about them. Talk about them. Talk to your friends. Talk to your neighbors. Talk to the people around you. Talk to your spiritual family. Talk to your, talk, Your whole life's oriented around this, and your whole life is wrapped up in the life of the community, not just your own little individual isolated life. Why? So you don't run into left field. There's protection and there's power in the community. I want to show you uh, one other place that that is interesting in this regard, Acts chapter 2. This is the very first account of the very first church, okay? Okay. So Jesus has died, he has risen from the dead, he has ascended into heaven, and his followers, his disciples now are beginning to see this movement spread, this this Jesus movement, at the time they called it the way. It wasn't called Christianity yet, it was the way. And they're beginning to see this movement gain traction and gain momentum in the city of Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 44, we find the very first account of what the early church actually looked like. And it, by the way, it didn't look like this, as cool as this is. Oh. None of that's what matters. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 44. And all the believers, all the believers met together in one place. That sounds like a gathering, a service, something like that. They, they met together in one place, and they shared everything they had. Well, that's different than what we do. By the way, I'm not suggesting that we do that necessarily. If you like your things, that's fine. <laughs> They sold their property and possessions and they shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple every day. And they met in homes for the Lord's Supper. And they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. That sounds very different than modern American church, right? They were just like, they were so tight. (laughs) They were so close. They were so bound together in what they believed and who their Savior was, that they couldn't help being together all the time. So when you read the Shema, Deuteronomy, thousands of years before this, talk about it all the time, just talk about it, talk about it, talk. and then you look at the believers met together every day in the temple and they worshiped, and then they, then they went to homes and they shared the Lord's Supper together. And well, What do you think they were talking about? They were talking about their faith. They were talking about the scriptures. It was the central orienting point of all of their lives. And and so here's the thing. There's tons of verses, passages, stories that I could use to illustrate this. But this is a little bit of a tough truth because the reality is, again, for the people who wrote the Bible, there was no reference point for the way we experience faith today. So I I tried to pull a couple that, that, that show it well. But here's the truth, and this is what I want you to know today, that if you're going to follow Jesus, like you have have to understand this. We follow Jesus better when we follow Jesus together. Like you can do it alone. You can. But it just doesn't work very well. It It is amazing to me how many people I'll talk to and and I'll hear stories about how things just aren't going that well and 
they don't know how to get past this thing or that thing and they just feel stuck in this or that or whatever. And inevitably, it's like they have no real community of faith. Now maybe again, maybe they're a part of a church. Maybe they even have like a small group. Maybe they have some friends, but they don't talk about spiritual things. They just talk about life as if life is divorced from faith. But they shouldn't be. If Jesus is the center, then Jesus should be everything. And if Jesus is everything, then we should be talking about him. And maybe that sounds weird because you're like, well, I've never talked about Jesus before. Well, that's fine. It's not actually as weird as it might seem. You just do it. And and eventually you figure out how to use the right words. (laughs) This is this is huge. We follow Jesus better when we follow Jesus together. This is this is huge. It helps us stay on track. And it helps us stay on track because we don't tend to come up with our own opinions devoid of wisdom and understanding that we don't have yet. Does that make sense? So one of the best case studies I could think of in this is Wikipedia. Okay, you familiar with Wikipedia, the online encyclopedia? When Wikipedia was first launched years and years and years ago, it developed a very negative reputation. And the reason that it developed a very negative reputation is because anyone can go onto Wikipedia and post changes to content, which seems like a terrible idea, right? But what they've found as time has gone on is that Wikipedia has become one of the most reliable sources of information that exists in the world. And it's because of the power of community. Now, I could go on there right now, and I could change. By the way, I didn't start today talking about the Bengals, and I missed it on that. My goodness, the Bengals won yesterday. Uh... I could go on to the Bengals Wikipedia page right now and I could edit it. And I could say that the Bengals won the AFC championship the last five years. I could put that on Wikipedia. But you know what would happen? Somebody very quickly would come along behind me and would change that. And when they did, they would put a citation or a source that then Wikipedia's editors would verify based on the source material that what they wrote is correct and what I wrote is incorrect. And so by nature of the community, anyone who knows a fact that a fact that is on Wikipedia that is incorrect, they can cite source material and correct it. And because of the scope of the number of people that use it, it ends up becoming very, 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 very accurate over time. Does this make sense? This is how it is in faith. If you're going about it in isolation, there are going to be things that you read and you interpret a certain way based on your your background, your baggage, your pain, your wounds, your whatever, that you're going to read a certain way and and it's not going to be true. But you don't know that because you just don't know. You don't know what you don't know, so you shouldn't be expected to be able to just read it and get it all and you need reference material. You need source material. Well, I mean, I don't know about you, but I happen to like reading commentaries, which are just really thick books that break down the Bible in like crazy specific detail. Does that sound fun? And some of you are like, yeah. Others of you are like, no. And that's fine. If that sounds like no, great. You don't need to read the commentaries, but you do need people around who maybe have read some of them. You, you need people around who, who, who have a depth of maturity in their faith that you don't have just yet. You need people ahead of you in their faith and you need people behind you in your faith. You need people all around. And that's how, that's how then as a group, as a body, like we may get a little bit off course at some point in time, but guess what? It's going to get corrected. Come. Sometimes you'll get stuck believing lies. And you need somebody to tell you the truth that you don't know. Especially if you're young in your faith, sometimes you will get stuck believing absolute lies from the pits of hell. I don't have this in my notes today, and I wasn't going to say it, but I'm going to because doggone it, it's perfect. There's a passage in Scripture where it talks about how Satan, our enemy, is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I've talked about this a thousand times. How do lions hunt? Do you know how lions hunt? They try to isolate an animal. So if a pack of lions, if a pride of lions sees a pack, I don't know, of wildebeest, I don't know what they're called, but a group of wildebeest, they can't attack the whole herd because they'll die. But what they'll do is they'll chase the herd until one animal isn't strong enough to keep up. And then they'll kill that one animal. 
I love that the Bible describes Satan that way because it's such a perfect picture. Satan wants you to be isolated and, and, and by yourself in your faith because if you're by yourself, he can lie and lie and lie, which by the way, that's another way the Bible describes him as the father of lies. He will lie and lie and tell you things that are like just borderline true, but they're not, and that'll completely derail your faith. You have to have people around you who, when there are lies in your head, will be able to tell you, no, that is not true. That is not who God says you are. That is not what God says about you. That is not what God says about the situation. Stop believing the lies. Okay, so I, I want to read three more passages very quickly. Um, and, and they all kind of deal with this, that this idea that we follow Jesus better when we follow Jesus together. One of my favorites is from Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And, and I like this because it's just, um, it's, it's common sense. But you know, sometimes common sense is is common, but it doesn't actually, doesn't hit us. Two people are better off than one because they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three or even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Let me read you another one. This is one. This is my very favorite in this whole line. Proverbs 27. An open rebuke is better than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. Sorry, I, I was thinking the NIV. I know the NIV. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. And the, in the NIV, it says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. In other words, the people who love you will tell you what you want to hear when you don't want to hear it. And people who don't care about you will just kiss your butt. And they'll never say a hard thing to you. We need people who will tell us what we don't want to hear when we need to hear it. Lastly, in Galatians chapter 6, Paul is writing and he's giving instructions to the Galatian church. He says, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, in other words, if another believer has, they're, they're just, they're off the rails. You who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Be careful that you don't end up in the same place they are. Share each other's burdens. And in this way, you'll obey the law of Christ. Now that's a passage, and all of these really are passages, that in our isolated American context don't sound great, right? Nobody can judge my faith. It's my relationship with God. Paul would say differently. Paul would say that if you're a Christian, you absolutely can look at other Christians and be like, hey, I'm concerned for you. Hey, I'm worried about, hey, I, I'm concerned that the road you are on is going to lead you to death and destruction. And, and Solomon in Proverbs would say, yeah, that's what a friend does. You know what an enemy does? They never say a word to you because they don't want to judge you. Do you think it's more loving to watch somebody kill themselves or to do everything you can to prevent it from happening? Well, that's not the way that our culture communicates about love, is it? Love looks like, hey, it's your life. Hey, it's your faith. Yes, correct. But it's our job as a spiritual family, as a spiritual body, to help each other to Jesus. So we follow Jesus better when we're together. And ultimately what that means is that, especially if you're new in faith, or maybe you... Um, Maybe you just don't have this in your life right now. Um, if, if, you, if you want to follow Jesus well, you have to pursue the right people who will keep you on the right road. You got to pursue the right people who will keep you on the right road. Here's what I mean by that. If you're just going to like sit back and wait for the right people to fall into your lap, it probably isn't going to happen. You've got to pursue it. You've got to say, I know, I recognize the truth that I need the right people around me, and so I'm going to seek that out. If I look around me and I go, the people that are around me aren't helping me get where I want to be, then you need to pursue the right people. 
And specifically, you need to make sure there are people who are going to keep you on the right road. You don't need yes men around you. You don't need people who are going to go, well, it's your faith. Whatever, whatever you think is best, live your truth. If you have live your truth friends, you don't have friends. It's probably one of the harsher things I've ever said. But if you have live your truth friends, they aren't really your friends. Because they'll watch you destroy your life before they'll step up and help you. You need the right people who will do what it takes to keep you on the right road. So, if you want to get to Jesus, you need people who are on their way to Jesus. If you want to get to Jesus, you need to find people who are on their way to Jesus. If you want to get to the top level of your career, you want to find people who have made their way to the top level of your career. If you want to get to Jesus, you find people who are on their way to Jesus. And then you help each other get there. So, this is going to feel like a uh, very shameless plug, and it kind of is. But um, we, we have small groups at City North. And uh, the reason we have small groups is this. It's because I believe this. I, I, don't just, I don't just preach this because, I don't know, it sounds good, or like, I want to get good group numbers. I preach messages similar to this on a very regular basis because we just don't live this way. And it makes all the difference in the world when you have the right people around you to help you stay on the right road. And so we have small groups as a church because I know that it can be very, very hard to find those people. And so we create opportunities for you to have those relationships if you don't currently. That's it. It's the only reason we do small groups. We opened our small group directory today for our spring small group semester. We do semesters because I know that signing up for a small group, if it's like a, well, it goes for a year, that's overwhelming. So we do 13 weeks. That way, if you try one and you're like, these people are weird, you have an out. You don't even have to say anything to them. You can just not go back after 13 weeks and you're done. Uh, we, we do semesters because we know that life is busy and we don't want people feeling like they're signing up for their whole life. But what I do want is to create opportunities for you to find people, the right people, who will help keep you on the right road. So if you're interested in that, uh, many of you here have been a part of City North Small Groups before, and you know you've found people who will help you do that. Some of you have not been, and that's absolutely fine. If you don't sign up for a group, it's fine. I'm not going to hunt you down. I'm not going to come find you, and it's not going to happen. It's, it's on you. You've got to make that choice. But if you're interested in that, you can go to groups.citynorth.church, and there's a directory on there where you can browse through different groups. There's all kinds of different groups. with all. I think there's eight groups this semester or something, and um, they all have different topics and different focuses. There's some men's groups. I know my friend Michael's got a disc golf group going uh, again this year, which today sounds terrible. Uh, uh, we've got uh, my wife and I are leading a parenting group this semester because, good gosh, we need the help. Um, I say we're leading it. We're watching somebody else talk about it. <laughs> We're like, yes, that, we'll do that. Um, I know that uh, I've got some other friends that are leading like a women's kind of a group. Um, my friend Scott's leading a couple different men's groups. Um, I'm forgetting several, but there's a variety of groups available. Different days of the week, different times. Find something. The worst thing that happens if you jump into a small group is that you get through the semester and you go, well, that was a waste of my time. I mean, that's the worst thing that happens. But can we be honest? We all waste as much time as we're going to waste in group on Netflix or on Hulu or on whatever anyway. So just waste time in a different place for a few weeks. <laughs> Best case scenario, you find a couple of people who legitimately end up changing your life because of how they love you. Best case scenario, you find some people that you don't have to pretend anymore you can be real with and who help you get through some things that you didn't know that you could ever get through before. That's a trade that I think is worth making. <laughs> but I can't make that decision for you. Now, I'm done talking about groups because I don't want it to sound like a sales pitch. I want to end with just a, an, an image real quick. There's one of two ways that we can look at this, right? Because when we read things like what Paul wrote, talking about like, if you're a believer, help hold other believers who are caught in sin accountable. Some of you are probably immediately going into church PTSD mode. And you're like, oh my gosh. Does that mean like, if I show up with the wrong clothes on, somebody's going to berate me for it? No. And if that happens, please come tell me because I'm going to berate them for it. <laughs> no, that, no. 
Imagine for a moment that you and I were driving in a car, and um, this is a little bit hard to imagine in central Ohio, but when I was in college, I took a, uh, I took a bicycle tour of Southern California, and we rode right down the Pacific Coast Highway. So that's always the image that I get in my mind when I, when I think of this analogy. Imagine we're driving somewhere, and there's a, there's a sheer cliff off the side of the road. It's just you and me, we're in the car. And uh, imagine for a moment that as we come up to a curve, you realize that I'm not turning the wheel. I'm driving. I'm not turning the wheel. What do you do? Do you just look at me and go, well, live your truth? Well, no, that's stupid. <laughs> You'd probably yell at me first, <laughs> which would be appropriate. And then if I didn't immediately respond and turn the wheel, what would you do? Well, you'd probably try to grab the wheel and turn the car. <laughs> Why? Why would you do that? Isn't that judgmental of my driving capacity? No. That would be you trying to make sure we don't die. That would be loving. And that would be caring. So we have the opportunity to look at something like this as judgmental. We also have the opportunity to look at it as the most loving thing a friend could do is to keep us from driving off the cliff when we don't realize that's where we're headed. Now that's counterproductive in our culture. That's not the way our culture talks about it. But at the end of the day, if you want to follow Jesus well, you need people around you who will call you out, who will hold you accountable. I was thinking this week as I was preparing for this message about the, the immense number of times in my life that I had people that I cared about sit me down and look at me and be like, you have to stop this. This is not okay. Chief among them, my mother. Um, second among them, my dad. I remember a time my youth pastor, um, when I was probably 13, um, we had a pretty good sized youth group when I was growing up. And um, by nature, the fact that my parents were leaders in the church, I was always kind of at the center of everything. And um, I like, to, I like to really give other people a hard time. I like to make fun of other kids. And I did it in a playful way, like I was joking. But the reality is it doesn't feel that way when you're a kid, does it? I remember my youth pastor pulling me into his office one Sunday. And um, he sat me down and he looked at me and he said, Andrew, you got to quit ripping on people. He said, I know that you're trying to joke with them, but like, it's not kind. That's not how Jesus would want you to behave. You got to quit. Now, if you know me, I, I forget everything everything. I'll never forget that conversation as long as I live. And there wasn't one moment where I thought, oh man, he's being judgmental. I thought, Steve really loves me. And if he thinks this is a big deal, it probably is. And we need that time and time and time and time and time again, I've had that in my life. And it's one of the only reasons I am where I am today. I want that for you. I want that for everybody in this family. That we would have people around us who know us well enough that when we're in a bad spot, they'd be able to call us and say, hey, what's going on? Like, you are not yourself today. You are not yourself in this season. Is there any, what can I be praying, you, praying for you about? And then if maybe we start to talk to them and they realize like there's some, there's some stuff here that's, that's just not, it's not true. There's some lies. We'd be able to say, hey, hold on a minute. You know I love you, right? Listen, this is a lie and you've got to replace it with some truth. Or that we would have people in our lives who, if we just start doing dumb stuff, <laughs> they'll call us out on it. <laughs> I don't want anybody to drive off a cliff. I certainly don't want anybody to drive off a cliff without knowing they're about to drive off a cliff. We follow Jesus better when we follow Jesus together, so get the right people in your life. It may be the thing that saves you. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your love and your grace. Father, thank you that in my life, for me personally, thank you for the way that you have put people in my life over time who don't put up with garbage when I've got garbage going on. Thank you for giving me people, surrounding me with people who will call me out when I need it, who, as Proverbs teaches, who will wound me when I need it and won't just blow kisses because they don't want to confront anything. Father, thank you for your word that teaches us truth that goes against what we, I don't know, what we might just kind of naturally believe and that shows us how to appropriately think about culture and that shows us how to, how to process our reality. Thank you for your word that gives us a picture of what it can look like. 
when we're really together as one family, as one body, who love each other enough to help each other when we're running out into left field. So Father, today I pray for every one of us, for those of us who, who struggle, with, with, who struggle with, with confronting, who struggle with stepping in and who feel like maybe, oh, I don't want to overstep, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment and confidence to know when to step in, when to step out, when to say what we maybe don't want to say, but we're willing to because we care. And Father, for those of us that struggle with receiving any kind of criticism, that struggle with receiving feedback that we might think is negative, I pray you would give us perspective and peace and calm to understand that when people who care about us come to us with concerns, it's not because they don't like us or because they're judging us. It's because of their deep love and respect for us. Father, make us all a people, make us a family that learns how to balance kindness and grace with truth that learns how to step in when we need to step in, but that knows how to do it in a way that, was re- that is like you do it, redemptive, restorative, kind, gracious, and gentle. God, help us as we do this to never become people that become arrogant in our own ability to pick out the stuff in others. But help us to be people that are humble in recognizing that we are no different from anyone else, broken, people, sinners in need of a perfect Savior. Now, with every head bowed and with every eye closed, I want to give an opportunity today. Maybe you're here and you've never made a choice to give your life to Jesus. Um, I mean, this message today is aimed directly at Christians. So if you're not a Christian, this isn't even really applicable to you. And that's okay. (laughs) But if you're here today and you've never made a choice to give your life to Jesus, I want to give you the chance to do that. For every one of us, there comes a point in life where we've got to recognize that we're going it alone and it doesn't work and that we need somebody to save us because we're just making a mess of it. In, in a biblical sense, we've all got to come to a place of recognizing that we're just a sinner and we need a savior. And if that's you today and you're tired and you're worn down and you've tried everything, but you've never just surrendered to God, I want to give you the chance to do that. The Bible says that if we believe in our heart that Jesus was raised from the dead and if we speak with our mouth that he's in control, he'll save us. That's it. No religious stuff. So if you're here today, you've never made that choice, but you realize you want to, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. So what's going to happen is I'm going to say a simple prayer of faith and confession out loud, and we're just going to repeat it back together as one body, as one family. And if you want to pray that prayer alongside us, just simply pray it from your heart to your Savior. We're not going to draw attention to it, call it out, make a big deal of it, but you can pray it with us. God will hear from heaven and he'll save you today. So if that's you, pray with us. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for my sin. And I believe you rose from the dead. So today I surrender to you. I give you control. Lead me and guide me. And send me people to help me stay on the right path. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ today we pray. Amen.